Hello! Today we're going to talk about how I am a physics failure, how I ditched astrophysics, the most noble of the sciences, or a corporate job, and we're going to talk about how I'm just a sellout. I'm a corporate sellout. That's what I am. Yeah, that's what today's story is going to be about. But seriously though, hey guys, it's Priya, and today I'm just going to talk about why I ended up in data science as someone who was a physics major, and I'm going to go through everything in depth to let you guys know what all of your avenues are as a physics major or someone who already has a physics degree because there's so much you can do. There really isn't any job a physics major can't do, which is really great. It's something I absolutely did not know when I started. So I'm gonna go straight into my journey. So let's start all the way in the beginning. When I started at the University of Chicago, a lowly physics major, I think what I didn't realize all the way in the beginning was that not every physics PhD PhD went on to become a professor, have their own lab, and literally discover the origin of the universe because I love cosmology. That is everything I love. Like even last night I was reading The Grand Design by Stephen Hawking. Like it's just something that I've always been captivated by even though I left the industry. And I always thought I would have my own lab. I would just work for NASA or work for something like that. But in reality, most physics PhDs don't end up getting a professorship let alone a tenured professorship. I think the statistic is about 0.5% of physics PhDs end up in that field as a professor. And by and large, professorship equates to having your own research lab, having the funding for, you know, life-changing research. And I always thought I would go that route. I just did not know how uncommon it was for a physics PhD to go that route because throughout my time at UChicago, I had absolutely the smartest teaching assistants ever. I learned so much from my peers from my teaching assistants who were physics grads at UChicago. And by the time I was applying to jobs, I realized that they were about to finish their PhD and they were also applying for jobs. And I was like, wait, what? But yeah, a lot of them go into data science, software engineering, quantitative finance. That's where all of the money is at. They love physics majors and physics PhDs. So I think just realizing that physics is kind of, for me, would have been a shoddy career because I would not have gotten to the point of a professorship. I already know that. I went in expecting that and that's not really what I got. So initial reactions to UChicago physics, it's mind-blowing how many people we have on campus. We have the director of the Dark Energy Survey. We had the director of the Giant Magellan Telescope. Wendy Friedman was nominated for a Nobel Prize in 2014, but actually, and I think she was poached from Stanford. The people you're around, my professors are, you know, the pioneers in their field. They're the ones who write the papers that we all cite. And being in the midst of that, it was absolutely amazing. I couldn't have asked for a better astrophysics experience or a better place to have it. But when I was taking those classes from the beginning to later on, like, you know, mechanics, electrodynamics, thermodynamics, like statistical physics, all of that, I did not enjoy it as much as I enjoyed astrophysics specifically. And I think the reason, other than just conceptually, astrophysics is something I've always been interested in. I like the fact that I could actually quantify things and it wasn't all theoretical. Like, yes, it, it is theoretical when you're analyzing telescope data or you're analyzing images, but using, you know, a neural network to actually identify images that we're getting back from a telescope as a gravitational lensed object or not a gravitational lensed object. That use case was really interesting to me. I was like, wow, we can do real things on a massive scale in computational astrophysics. And I took computational astro actually after I already accepted a job as a data scientist because I actually recruited very early on senior year. So two weeks into senior year, I knew I was going to be a data scientist at my company. So I ended up taking more quantitative style classes where I got to code in a physics slash astrophysics environment. And I absolutely loved it. And I think I realized that tangible aspect where I'm actually doing something rather than being a small cog, not a cog, but a small blip of research in the larger scheme of research in a lab. Like I liked having a product, something tangible that I could give to someone like, hey, I've created a model that can identify all of these astronomical objects. I love that so much. And I was also much better at that than theoretical math that I would do otherwise, like in any of my physics classes. So that mix of CS is really like where I want to go into now with this video. I think that it really showed me so many doors because I didn't know how to code until my junior year. And that's when I felt like this is my place. I started getting A's. I took 
grad level physics classes as an undergrad. It was amazing. And it was all because I saw the power that computer science, specifically Python, could give me in this industry. I was mind blown. Like, honestly, I don't know where I'd be if I didn't take the introductory computer science class at U Chicago. It's not really even introductory. They taught us all of Python, all of it in 10 weeks. It was probably the most stressful class I've ever taken, but it was also the most beneficial in my life. So that mix of CS alongside the very abstract nature of physics, which is to solve problems. Like if you are a physicist, if you have any degree in physics, if you've ever taken a physics class, you must have learned how to slowly backtrack from the larger picture and figure out the little pieces you need to solve to get to that larger picture. That detail oriented nature within that big picture, that whole abstract problem solving is the number one skill physics teaches you, which is the number one skill that's tangentially applicable to every industry. And that's how data science is. It, it is applicable to every industry. Every single industry needs someone who can analyze, synthesize, and predict on data. And when I learned that bit of detail my junior year, I knew that a physics PhD wasn't as enticing to me as was a job that could literally be applicable in every industry. So the two sorts of jobs I ended up applying to were consulting and data science. And I went the more technical route with data science because I think that's just who I am. Like I like solving computational problems, whether that's on paper and is like, you know, calculus or whether it's like all in Python, which is my main area of expertise. I want to kind of touch on how I think truly like data science and coding is the future because it is, like I said, the most applicable. If you learn how to build predictive models using machine learning libraries in Python, that's applicable to any industry you could ever want to be a part of. If you want to stay in astrophysics, you could do that as a data scientist because that's what most of computational astrophysics is. It's actually just data science, but the data you're working with, data regarding our solar systems, galaxies, beyond, but it's still data science. And I I think the fact that in the future, once you can analyze any kind of data, you can do anything. You could work as a data scientist in absolutely any industry. And I think the world is really your oyster at that point. So that was just more my style of thinking, I guess, at the point, because when you're like, you know, 17 and you go to college, you don't really know what you're going to do. You don't know what you're good at. And I think I like the fact that data science was so generalizable at the age of like, you know, 20 when I was applying to all of these jobs. So the fact that I already felt like it was the future and the fact that genuinely like I implore everyone, especially physicists, physics majors, everyone to learn how to code, that's going to take you so far. And let's, let's move on to the pay scales because that is a big thing. I hate the term corporate sellout, but like I jokingly call myself that all the time. But truly, like if I was to get a physics PhD, if I got accepted into any programs and then I decided to, you know, actually pursue it for about four to six years, I would get paid, you know, potentially as a teaching assistant, I would work as a teaching assistant on campus and I would have a stipend, but that stipend, it's usually capped. I think it's like around $18,000 plus whatever you get as a teaching assistant. So I don't know what that would be. Maybe 15,000, 20,000 a year. Maybe I'm not really sure, but it's just very low compared to what you can get as a tech salary, or I don't even work in tech per se. Like, yes, I work for a tech company, but like we do market research. So I'm I'm in the market research industry as a data scientist and the pay it is just better than how much you would get as a PhD student. So if living, cost of living, quality of life, all of those things are important and they outweigh the fact that, you know, for six years, you're going to be working as a student after undergrad, then it's kind of clear that there is a way to still hold true to the nature of physics, everything you've learned about that abstract problem solving and actually quantifying, you know, the world around you. You could do that, but you know, in a corporate setting. I have two physicists on my team. One has an undergrad degree and the other was actually a professor of physics. So they're all on my team at data science. And it is really a fact that like in data science, you're going to see just as many physicists or mathematicians or statisticians as you are computer scientists. So it's, it's really interesting stuff. So I'm going to kind of end it there. I think that was pretty much it for my journey. It was just like a lot of realizations that, you know, in the beginning, I realized that I glorified physics too much. I thought I would have that research setting. I thought I would discover, I don't know, the next Higgs boson and like, you know, things like that, that every child dreams of. And slowly realized,
realizing that there was a tangible space for me with data and using astrophysics data to get to where I am now. Like I still work with it sometimes. I tutor a student for her AP independent research study and it's literally me teaching her machine learning and how to use machine learning in an astrophysics setting. So it's always gonna stay true to me. Like I learned so much that I'm not just gonna forget, you know? And I still like to conceptually keep up with everything that's happening in the astrophysics field. But at the end of the day, data science was my out. And in the future, I don't want to stay in data science in a corporate setting. I've always known that, but you know, I wanna go into the entrepreneurial realm, the startups and do the things. So whenever I get to that, I'm sure my physics background will help me immensely as will my background in data science now, having learned how to analyze and th synthesize large amounts of data. So with that being said, that's pretty much it for me. I know this was a very qualitative video, but if you have any specific questions or you wanna see any videos related to physics, astrophysics, data science specifically, cause I know I didn't talk about my work as much, but I work with anomaly detection and machine learning algorithms and I'm building a new model out for my company. So happy to talk about any of that within reason. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to smash that like button and drop a hi down below and subscribe. And I will see you guys at the next video.